Hey guys, so now that you've learned how to use conservation of energy to solve motion problems, and you've learned how to use conservation of momentum to solve either push away problems or collision problems, we're gonna put the two of them together into more elaborate sort of longer questions. And these tend to be pretty popular, especially if your professor is doing uh, long answers or free response types of questions. So let's check it out. All right, so it says here, um, some collision problems have more than one part. So rather than just having a collision, we're gonna have some motion either before or after the collision. So one or both objects will be moving either before or after the collision. The Probably the most common example is a bullet gets shot into a block and this block moves and it eventually stops, okay? So in these problems, we'll use, as I mentioned, both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And the order might change depending on what's happening. Energy will deal with motion, the motion part of the problem, and momentum will deal with the collision or the push away, the two objects pushing away from each other, um, part of the problem. So let's jump straight into the example and show you how this works. Um, a 20 kilogram crate slides on a smooth horizontal surface. So let's draw a horizontal surface here. Crate has mass 20 kilograms and it slides this way with 40 meters per second. Okay, um, smooth meaning that friction is zero, no friction, okay? Uh, the box then collides and sticks to a 30 kilogram crate that is initially at rest. So there's a, third, uh, a second crate, uh, so over here, of mass 30 that is initially at rest, okay? So I'm gonna put here zero meters per second, not moving. After the collision, the crates stick together and go up a frictionless, again frictionless, incline that makes an angle of 37 with the horizontal. So somewhere after the collision point, um, this there's an incline like this, makes an angle of 37 with the horizontal. And I'm gonna draw the 30 and the 40 sort of going up together. 30 and 40 going up together. This is after the collision. Um, eventually, they will stop, right? Eventually, they'll stop. Um, that's common sense, but also because it tells me how high will, um, how high up the hill will the crates reach, meaning they do eventually stop and then they come back down, right? They don't like fall over the, the hill, uh, over the incline and fly over. So at some point they stop and I wanna know what is the final heights over here. For now, I'm just gonna call this H. Um, and I'm also going to want to know what is the length of the plane here. The length of how far up the plane do you go, okay? So just to be clear, how high up the plane is H, it's a vertical, um, and how far up the plane is L. It's this distance here versus this distance here. They're different, okay? Uh, slight different uh, difference in wording and it means a big difference. I want to real quick remind you before we jump into this that there is a relationship however between L and H um, which is when I have L here and I have theta here and I have H here H is L sine of theta. So later on what we'll see is that if you find one you can get the other. Alright so let's go how do we find H? Well I want to first point out that there's two parts to this problem. The first one is from here to right about, um, the first thing that happens here is the collision, okay? First thing that happens is here's the collision. So yes, this object is moving, there's some motion before the collision, but that motion doesn't change, it's just moving with 40 all the time, so we don't worry about that. The first thing that happens, the first change that happens um, is there's a collision somewhere here. After that collision, the objects um, will move up the hill. There's some sort of motion here, okay? Because there's a collision here, we're going to use the conservation of momentum equation, MOM. I'm gonna write that as a shorthand for momentum. And here we're going to use the energy equation because there's motion, okay? Now there's two parts. I'm gonna go a little bit slower because I'm first introducing this, but the beginning here um, 
uh, of this piece, which is the what happens before the collision is the initial part. After the collision is final. Okay. Now, when you look go to the second part of the problem, the initial part of motion is here, which is initial, and the final part of motion is here, which is final. Now, there's a problem here, which is I have two initials and two finals, and the final velocity of the first part of the problem is the same as the initial velocity of the second part. So here we can run into some complication. So what I like to do, and this is what I want to show you, is instead of using I, F, I, F, I'm going to use A, B, and C. And I'm going to draw a little diagram to help us organize our thoughts. I like to draw this little diagram to show this is point A. Recall point A, in this case, um, there's a collision here. Point A, actually let me put the collision up here. There is a... Uh, collision. Point A is the point or the velocity before the collision. So I'm going to write pre-collision initial. The final point here is after the collision. So I'm going to write post-collision. This is point B. Point B is the end of the collision and the beginning of motion. Um, and point C is the end of the motion. So I'm just going to call this the end of motion where the object stops. Okay? So instead of saying initial, final, and then initial and final, and having to remember that the final of the first is the same as the initial of the second, I'm going to refer to these points as A, B, and C. Okay? I'm going to refer to this mass as the first mass, just because it's on the left and the second mass as uh, mass is 1 and 2, okay? So I have two equations to write because I have two conservations. I have the conservation, uh, there's a collision here, so I'm going to write, um, I'm, I'm going to write, sorry, I meant to write momentum here because there's a collision, and I meant to write energy here um, because there's conservation of energy there. Okay, so I'm going to write the momentum equation from points A to B. So between A and B, I have a momentum equation. So it's going to look like this. Objects 1 and 2, so it's M1 V1 plus M2 V2, M1 V1 plus M2 V2. Again, I'm setting this up for you um, because once we get a, a nice system, it'll be easy to solve this. Um, now I'm going from A to B, so it's initial. We're going to call it not initial, but we're going to call it A. And instead of final, we're going to call it B. That's the first equation. The second equation I can write is an equation from points B to C. It's the second part of the problem. And the objects are moving. So I'm going to write a conservation of energy equation. K plus U plus work non-conservative equals K plus U. Now I'm going from B to C. So it's BB, C, C. All right? So the first step is going to draw this stuff, um, the entire situation. Um, I like to quickly draw a little diagram that summarizes what's happening, and then I write my two equations. And then you just plug numbers into the equations and you solve it. Now there's a lot of algebra, obviously, but let's check it out. All right, so what are we looking for? We're looking for H final, okay? So I want you to look at these two equations and tell me where do you see an H final. Now by final, it's the second part um, it's the, the, the final of the second piece. So this is A, this middle here is B, this is C. So I want HC. Do you see an HC in either one of these equations? And the answer is no, there's no HC. However, it is here somewhere, right? I got A's over here, B's over here. I got B here and C here. C is here. Do you see an HC in here? And I hope you saw or you realize that there is an HC here because the gravitational potential energy at point C is MGH at point C. So when I expand that equation, the H is going to show up. Now, you don't necessarily have to do this. You don't have to go look for the variable and figure out where it is. You can just start expanding this and then look for it. Okay? You don't have to... Um, know exactly where it's going to come from 
but it's helpful sometimes. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start here just to make the H show up. Um, kinetic energy. Is there kinetic energy at point B? Point B, let's refer right here, point B is post-collision. Immediately after the collision, is um, this object moving? And the answer is yes. And in fact, it will always be the case that post-collision, the object's moving. That's the whole point of these questions. So I have kinetic energy. What about potential energy? Remember, there's two types of potential energy. Um, one is gravitational, if you have a height, and one is elastic, if you have a spring. There's no springs here. And right after the collision, um, both boxes are still on the floor, so there is no gravitational energy of any type. What about work non-conservative? Work non-conservative is the work done by you. If you're doing anything here, you're not, you're just watching, um, plus the work done by friction. There's no friction. Both this surface and this surface are smooth, they're frictionless, therefore there's no work done by you or no work done by friction. Um, what about kinetic energy at point C? Point C is at the end where it stops, and by definition, since it stops, um, there is no kinetic energy at point C. What about potential energy at point C? Well, again, potential energy, there's no springs, so there's no elastic, but the object did gain some height, so we are going to have potential energy. So now I can expand this equation here. Um, I can expand the K into half MVB squared equals MGHC. And that's my variable right there. That's what I need to get. Okay? Before we go to the other equation, um, let me talk about the mass. Okay? Now, while this object is going from right after the collision to up the plane, which mass do you use? Is it the 20? Is it the 30? And I hope you're thinking that it's actually... Um, by the way, I wrote, I wrote the masses wrong here. I hope you caught this. I'm so sorry. Um, this is 20 and 30. Okay? Is it 20 and 30? I hope you thought that the mass you should use is actually both. And that's true. It's both because they stick together. So mass here is going to be M1 plus M2, which in this case is 50. That being said, that's the correct mass. Even if you got the wrong mass, in this particular case, it wouldn't have mattered because the M's cancel anyway. Okay, so you wouldn't really write what the M is because it's going to cancel. Sometimes the M isn't going to cancel, so it's important that you know how to figure out which M to use. And in this case, HC, if I move the G over to the other side, will be this. Now look what happens. I'm ready to plug stuff in, or I'm almost ready to plug stuff in. The problem is I don't know what VB is. I know what 2 and I know what G are, um, but I don't know VB. So what do I do? Well, that's why there's two equations. I'm going to go over here and find VB. Okay? And that's what you're going to do with these problems. You're going to start from one equation, go into the other. If you don't know which equation to start from, it doesn't matter. Just pick one. Um, and if you hustle through it, you're going to get it. All right. Now, I need VB. Notice that there's V1B and then there's V2B. Well, what do we know about this problem? The objects are stuck together. So these two velocities are actually going to be the same, okay? So I can write this as M1VB plus M2VB. I don't have to write V1B and V2B. I just write VB because it's the same. And what that means is that I'm going to be able to combine the two like this, VB M1 plus M2. What about on the left side here? The first mass is a 20. The first mass, let me actually write M1 V1A. This velocity here is a 40. But this velocity here is a 0. A is before the collision. And before the collision, the 30 kilogram isn't even moving. Okay? So this is all I have. Um, it simplifies here like this. Okay? Notice that I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying to delay plugging the numbers until the end just so you can see how to do this with letters only. Um, VB equals M1 V1A divided by M1 plus M2. I have all these numbers. I have all these numbers. Therefore, I can just plug stuff in. M1 is 20. The velocity is 40. The masses are 20 plus 30. So this is 80 divided by 50. 
do I have this here? I do. It's going to be 16 meters per second. Okay. So VB and B, remember, is post-collision. The velocity post-collision is 16. It drops from 40 to 16. It makes sense because the object got heavier. You went from being a 20 kilogram block that's moving to now it's a 20 with a 30 moving together. So you're going to move slower. Okay. Now that I know that VB is 16, I can finally go back and plug this in here. Okay. And I'm going to have 16 squared divided by 2 times 9.8. And if you plug this into the calculator, you get 13.1 meters. Now, and that's the final answer. Okay. This thing is going to go up a distance, uh, a height of 18.1 meters. Now, all of this is just for part A, but luckily part B is pretty easy. Okay, So all of this is part A. I'm going to do part B in a little corner here. In fact, we had just talked about part B here. Um, if I want to know how far up, I want to know L, I can use this equation right here. L equals H divided by sine of theta. H, we just got over here, it's 13.1 divided by the sine of 37. And this means that L is 21.8 meters, 21.8 meters. Cool. Again, uh, took a little bit longer um, than what you would usually take to do or to explain one of these questions. But I wanted to, to introduce the idea of using A, B, and C and slowly show you what the equations are. Um, we're going to do a good, a good amount of practice because these are very popular and you should be able to do a bunch of these. Luckily, they're also very predictable. So we're going to do a bunch of them and you're going to be ready. All right. Hopefully this makes sense. Let me know if you guys have any questions.